Mini episode 89 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by DOU Productions, delivering coverage of sports and pop culture through columns, live blogs, and original videos. Follow them on the web at generationchatter.blogspot.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 89. This is a very special one today. Two FDH Lounge original dignitaries here to uh, break down a very unique uh, subject here. This is Rick Morris. I've got uh, Nate Noy on the line in a second uh, set to join us. What we have for you today, it's a project that we call the February 29th Time Capsule. Of course, this Wednesday, February 29th, is uh, the last that we will see of that date, uh, this being a leap year, uh, for the next four years. So what will happen between February 29th, 2012 and February 29th, 2016? We have predictions in seven different categories here. Uh, some of these are going to be absolute right and wrongs, and some of these are just going to be our opinions. Uh, so it's a, a mixture of that, and it's a mixture of all different subject matter, such as you will find in the FBH Lounge on a regular basis. In addition to Nate and I talking about this, breaking it down, I also have uh, some notes submitted to me by two of our other dignitaries, one other original FDH Lounge dignitary, Chris Galloway, and a gentleman who actually predates the FDH Lounge in his association with us, Ron Glasnap. Ron, of course, used to host Reality Check with Dave Adams and myself years ago, sort of a precursor to the FDH Lounge. But in the meantime, let's get started by bringing in my good friend, as I say, original FDH Lounge dignitary, Nate Noy, the one man who I knew could come in here and uh, co-host this with me and uh, do justice to the uh, subject matter. Nate, good to have you on, my friend. How are you today, buddy? Doing great, Rick. The first one that we have is uh, predicting teams that will have more than one championship in the next four years in the NFL, MLB, NBA, NHL, NCAA football, NCAA hoops. Uh, the, The picks that we have here on this end, Ron Glasnap says the Miami Heat, and uh, North Carolina basketball, he's predicting those. Chris Galloway predicts Kentucky basketball. That's the only one that he's predicting to have more than one title. I'm going with four, actually. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, and I thought about it for baseball too. I thought about possibly Atlanta and Tampa Bay. They're pretty well suited to win a couple of titles, but they're both in two of the toughest divisions in sports. I'm staying away from baseball. I'm staying away from the NHL because there's too many uh, top teams there that have a chance to do it. But I'm going to go in four different areas. The Green Bay Packers, Oklahoma City Thunder, I think including this year, and I know I'm sticking my neck out on that one, Alabama football, and Kentucky hoops. I think the SEC is going to have uh, teams that win multiple titles in both sports uh, the next couple of years. And not, not because SEC basketball is so great, but because Kentucky basketball right now under Cal Perry with his recruiting is. So that's, those are the picks on this end here. Uh, Nate, uh, who are the repeat champs that you see coming? I only have two as well, and it's funny because each was one of each of your first uh, dignitary picks. Uh, as much as I hate to say it, I think I looked at all the sports and looked at, okay, who's the most likely and who's less than 50%. I found two teams that in my mind are more than 50%. Uh, the first I hate to say, but it is the Miami Heat. I mean, Dwayne Wade is and they're on the same team, so... I think the Heat will win a couple championships. Uh, it won't be any fun to watch. But second is definitely Kentucky. Uh, I think this year's team is clearly the best team in the country. Although you're going to get Missouri into the league next year, which will be interesting to watch. And uh, you still got to get. But I didn't put Kentucky ahead of Miami because Kentucky's got a tougher path when it comes to four times. You know, you're competing with 345 teams versus the Heat, who compete with only 29 other teams each year. But I think those are the two that uh, that likely will repeat. Um, and I have some comments on your picks as well. But for the okay, uh, very very interesting. Uh, I, I ended up going with uh, probably two of the smallest market teams in pro sports. If you look at it this way, big time pro sports, anyways. Green Bay Packers, Oklahoma City Thunder. I don't think anybody would argue 
or maybe some folks would, but I don't think anybody would really uh, give too much uh, challenge to the notion of the Packers being best suited to win two titles in the next four years if you're looking at anybody. The Thunder in the NBA may be a little bit more controversial. Yeah, and if you force me to pick in the NFL, I'd actually probably stick with the Patriots. I think Brady has four or five good years left. Uh, oh, but the okay. Packers would be my second pick. But I just don't think anybody in the NFL can get two championships in four years in this era. Uh, you know, we saw this year the Packers were 15-1. and one. They looked unstoppable all preseason. Aaron Rodgers didn't have a great game against the Giants, and their season ended. And that's the problem with the NFL tournament each year is there's no more. You know, any team, team on the Minus seven. It's just so hard to predict, you know, consistency in the NFL. As you and I, in most years, uh, more than six teams repeat in the playoffs. So, you know, I don't think the Packers will miss the playoffs anywhere in that four-year span. It's just the, the nature of that tournament makes it so hard to, to repeat in the NFL. Uh, OKC, I agree. I mean, they they have uh, the cornerstone in place to have a chance to get there. Uh, the Heat standing their way in the West is always a tough league to to come out of, but uh, you know Durant is uh, you know right there with LeBron and Dwayne Wade in terms of the best player in the NBA. Um, UK we both agree on, you know Calipari, uh, greatest recruiter on the planet right now. He's got the Kentucky tradition. He's got this season, whatever happens to to look at, and they could knock off one of those four immediately. And then uh, with Alabama, you know I, I thought about college football. Uh, but there's, again, it's back to, and if you're going to pick one, Alabama's the pick. I agree with that. But, you know, USC should probably be back on the on the map here in the next couple of years. Uh, we'll see what happens with Urban Meyer and the Buckeyes a couple of years from now. LSU's not going anywhere with Miles there. And then being in the SEC, I mean, Alabama just needs to lose one time. Well, we think <laughs> in most years, yeah. you know, you get beat once in that, and you're not going to make the championship. So to, to say that a team in college football would have a great chance to take it you know, a bit of a stretch. If you're going to pick one, Alabama's the one to pick. Saban proved it this year. But I think it's just so tough in those other sports that, that I think that the separation comes with the heat and then U.K. But I, I, could, I wouldn't be shocked if we do this in four years and nobody repeated. Wouldn't be shocked at all. Last thing I'll point out on the NFL, uh, the, the Giants winning the Super Bowl this year in 2012 and also winning it in uh, 2008. So it, it has been done in recent years as far as teams winning it relatively close together. It doesn't seem that way just because uh, the, the Giants had, had so many disappointing years in between on that. Uh, number two subject here, uh, who will win the most championships in these different uh, uh, individual pursuits here? Although, again, NASCAR is, I suppose, a team one as well when you get into the crew. But for these purposes, we're treating it as an individual sport, NASCAR season titles, PGA champion, uh, major championships, men's tennis major championships, Grand Slam events, if you will, and the same thing on the women's side with tennis, Grand Slam championships. Uh, the way Ron Glasnap interpreted the question, I guess he interpreted it as uh, who's going to win uh, the most out of any of these different eras. He, areas. He went with Carl Edwards. That was his only pick, so maybe – He's picking Carl Edwards to win more season titles than anybody in any of the other different areas, even more grand slams than the other sports. Uh, that's my interpretation of his guess. Interestingly, Chris Galloway agreed in uh, Carl Edwards in the NASCAR one for uh, men's golf, major championships, very interesting, sticking his neck out. He thinks Phil Mickelson has enough good years left to get it done. I, it was, uh, that was an eyebrow raiser for me. The wow. funny thing for men's tennis and women's tennis Chris and I agreed on both of these. Novak Djokovic, I mean, he's the chalk pick right now. You've got, I mean, he's the next guy on top of the mountain right now. He's firmly ahead at this point of uh, Federer and ahead of uh, Nadal. Uh, Caroline Wozniacki, we both went with her, even though she has the rap of somebody who, I think an unfair rap as far as somebody who chokes, but uh, best not to have won any Grand Slams yet. Uh, but clearly Chris and I believe once she starts winning, uh, that she's uh, going to keep on going. So we agree on those two. Uh, backing up to the PGA, for me, I was going with kind of the chalk pick of Rory McIlroy. I think he's going to be pretty unstoppable the next couple of years. And for NASCAR, I'm going to go with the chalk. I know he didn't win last year, but how can you pick against a guy who's won five season titles? I'm going to go with Jimmy Johnson to have more season titles between this February 29th and the next time around. So, Nate, uh, your, your, your picks in the different areas? 
It's hilarious, Rick, because I'm sitting here looking at my sheet and everybody that I have listed <coughs> just got named. Uh, I, going to NASCAR first, how can you not say that the guy that just won five out of six at five in a row shouldn't be the favorite to win at least two of the next four? I mean, right. you know, I, I'm not a big NASCAR, NASCAR mark, but five in a row, I mean, he, he has to be the pick, he chalk or not. And, you know, he might not be the young up-and-comer anymore, but five in a row, it's hard to argue he doesn't at least have a 50-50 chance to pick up two more in the next four years. Uh, tennis, you know, the doll's only 25, so I, I went ahead and went with him. I know that uh, the guy he's competing with is in his age range, uh, but we'll see. I mean, uh, that that's one that, you know, 25 years old, neither one of these guys are probably even in their prime. Maybe they are. Maybe tennis is a little younger prime, but for the next four years, It'll be a one, two, one, two, one, two. It'll be interesting to watch. I think it's a, you know, a two-player uh, go at it in almost every tournament. Uh, PGA. How could you not pick McIlroy? Twenty-three years old. Twenty-three years old. He's ranked second in the world right now, and he's twenty-three years old. There's no question. He's the guy you have to go with. Uh, Luke Donald, who's the number one player in the world, thirty-five years old. So you know, twelve years of age on him. And, you know, maybe he's not the number one player in the world today, but by the time he's 39, McElroy would be 27 in the athletic prime of his career. You have to think McElroy would be the guy, if any of them, that could do it uh, in terms of winning multiple majors in the next four years. Absolutely. Uh, by, by the way, on, on, on Nadal, I think the thing that probably scares some of us, uh, the questions about his knee and the questions about how he's going to hold up physically. Uh, but, no, I mean, he's if it's not going to be Jokovic, I, I think most of us would probably guess uh, that it would be Nadal on that. Any uh, any guess on uh, the women's side? I know that's a real tough one to call. There's such parity on the women's side. Yeah, I'm with you. I looked at it, and I just didn't see one that I would want to, you know, say. I mean, obviously, somebody's going to be the, you know, win more, more majors than anyone else, but sure. so that's a sport that seems to have more, you know, this is the best player in the world for two tournaments, and then there's somebody else best player in the world for two tournaments, and there's somebody else. So I have a hard time predicting, you know, a sport that A, I honestly don't follow much, and B, when the rankings jump around like they do, you know, I don't want to make a prediction that it really would be like tossing a dart. So Okay, sure, sure. All, all, these, uh, all these picks are uh, optional here. Uh, the third one, uh, this shouldn't take us as long to get through. Uh, the answers have been pretty straightforward on this one. UFC, can it in the next four years get to the peak of where boxing was, which I would argue would be somewhere in the 1970s, the uh, the era of the uh, Ali Frazier trilogy. If you go back further in time, I mean, uh, Joe Lewis, uh, boxing was pretty central in American life then. Really, all through uh, the 70s into the 80s, it started to kind of drop off in the 90s, and since the era of Mike Tyson, it really hasn't done anything. Ron's guess is no. Chris's guess is no, but he say, an additional note, he says boxing will be close to dead by February 29th, 2016. I say no. I think that the retire, the forced retirement for health reasons of Brock Lesnar is going to set UFC back. I think long term they can get to that point in American sport, but I don't think it will be in the next four years, Nate. Yeah, and actually, Rick, I don't think they can long term. Not that it's the sport itself that doesn't have the following – to me, it's what's happened since boxing was in its heyday. And when boxing when it's hit, was in its heyday, the worldwide sports on ABC, there weren't a lot of options for people to watch things. I mean, that was the focus. The media loved it. And that's the stuff that was filtered down to the masses. We're in an age now where everybody's got a smartphone. You know, everybody can do what they want. They can watch what entertainment they want. They can grab whatever niche that they love and spend all their time dedicated to that. And once you get locked into what you really like to do, the odds on you opening your eyes up and looking around and say, well, there's U.S., you know, there's there's this, there's that. It doesn't happen anymore. People get locked into what they like, not as open to, you know, the media can't force things down them because if they try to, they just ignore it and go to what they like. So I think because of the technology, because of what's happened in society with things like smartphones, that it'll just it'll never get to that level, and it'll be hard for any sport uh, to ever reach that level again from the 70s because we just don't live in the same society. Interesting, yeah. It's not just the three major networks on TV anymore. I hadn't considered it from that point of view, but that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, the the fourth uh, question here: Who will be president on February 29th, 2016? President of these 
United States. Uh, Ron Glasnap, uh, coming very close to uh, my own point of view on this, which is interesting because I don't really know Ron's politics. I think they're they're way more middle of the road than mine are, but he's indicating Barack Obama, and not because he wants that to be the case, but because the Republican field is so pathetic, and I would certainly agree with that. Obama is my pick. Chris Galloway, a real idealist and somebody who really clings to more of a belief in the two-party system than do I at this point. Uh, Chris does not share my uh, belief in how morally bankrupt uh, the entire system is right now. He must foresee a brokered convention because his pick is Robert F. McDonald, who is, of course, the governor of Virginia and presently an endorser of Mitt Romney for president. So he clearly sees Bob McDonald throwing his hat in the ring here at some point and being anointed this summer in Tampa and going on to win the presidential race this fall. So two picks for Barack Obama, one shockingly for Bob McDonald. Uh, how do you see it, Nate? It's interesting Chris had pointed that out because uh, CBS this morning, one of their talk shows, had Chris Christie on, and there, there's a lot of speculation that this convention for Republicans will be, you know, nobody will clinch a number of delegates. It will be highly contested, and somebody that's not even on the map right now may end up being the nominee. Uh, all that said, I don't see how that person could possibly be Barack Obama with 67 days of campaigning versus what he's had for four years. Uh, you know, I don't intend to uh, – my pick is definitely Barack Obama. I think that there's too many obstacles for the Republicans to overcome at this point, and I think he, he will be president in four years. Yeah, it, it, I think uh, you know, all signs point to that at this point. And, and again, not, not because it's anything that I want to see or, or that you want to see with your politics being as close to mine as that, but just being realistic. Question number five, the film star in the highest grossing movie between February 29th, 2012 and February 29th, 2016 – uh, but on these next two categories, because the, the one after this is highest selling album by a musical act, I, I had said on the questionnaire, feel free to indicate somebody who's not really on the scene yet, and yet we all made picks on this one here. Uh, Ron even picked the movie. Sam Worthington in Avatar 2, he predicts, is going to be uh, the lead star in the highest grossing movie. Chris Galloway says uh, George Clooney as lead voice in an animated film. Uh, I am saying uh, Johnny Depp, for lack of a better uh, guess here, uh, in, in a role to be uh, determined. So what's your pick, Nate? Okay, I'm going to go way out of the limb here, Rick, but I looked, I thought about this one for a while, and I thought, okay, who has a following right now that might not even be an actor yet that has an unbelievable following that if he did a film, uh, some kind of featured film would get massive, massive turnout. I'm going to go with Justin Bieber, Rick. I think if he makes a jump to the big screen uh, with, the, with, the, with the base that he has of worshipers, that he could just blow the box office away if he decides to do a film in the next four years. And he's in an age where the next four years I could see him doing a film. Okay. i, I got to say, and it wasn't from anything in your, in your setup, but I was guessing for whatever reason you were going to say Peyton Manning. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe because you indicated it was somebody coming in from the outside. And I think we all know that sooner rather than later he's going to have to find something else to do. But uh, interesting. Be Bieber as a crossover here. I mean, uh, guys have done that. I mean, Really, going back to, to Elvis, uh, and, and maybe even, but well, I, I guess uh, Sinatra before that. I mean, it, it's, I guess it's almost as old as uh, film and music itself, uh, the, the crossover uh, between the two areas. Exactly. And who knows, maybe he won't even do a film. But, you know, again, I, I thought about Clooney, too. So, yeah, he's, he's the kind of guy that still has a, you know, massive appeal uh, to a lot of people. And it definitely could be an animated film, and the Avatar 2 pick's good as well. I think that'll be very highly grossing. So, yeah, that took a lot of guts uh, by by Ron uh, picking an, uh, an exact film uh, to be uh, uh, the, the one as well. Here, uh, props to him for that. Uh, highest selling album by a music act uh, between February 29, thousand twelve, and February twenty ninth, two thousand sixteen. Ron says Beyonce. Chris Galloway and I both say an artist yet to be discovered, or maybe not necessarily yet to be discovered, but somebody who right now for, would, would be basically be way too obscure to tab in that role. Somebody who's at the very least not on Chris's radar, not on my radar. At least that's how I interpret it personally here, whether it be... Uh, somebody who's an American Idol this year or next year or whenever the case may be. But my guess is we just haven't seen who that next person is going uh, to be to, to be a big seller. The, the music industry, we've talked about it a lot of times on the show. It's been pretty stale over the last 15 years or so. When you're looking at the very, you know, at, at the most popular types of music, there hasn't been many changes in it in the last 15 years or so. 
I just get the sense that that's due to change, but in a way that I, quite frankly, couldn't forecast. So, Nate, how do you see it shaking out? I agree completely with you, Rick. I mean, I know you're not a big fan, but two years ago, who, who on the planet had heard of Adele? Anybody? Sure. Anybody? No. No. So there's, we don't know that person yet. I agree completely. You know, the person that's going to have the highest grossing album in the next four years is somebody we don't know who they are right now. They're out there. But as you just pointed out, the way the music industry works is, you know, it's, it's the Jeremy Lin factor, hottest thing now, sells a bunch of albums, and we keep moving on. So, you know, I think it'll be something like that where somebody just comes from nowhere. You're right. Maybe they win Idol. Maybe they win the X Factor, one of these uh, contests. But... I think definitely it'll be somebody that we don't even know who they are today. So Yeah, I think that's entirely possible. With Adele, I, I, personally, I would say I mean the same as Whitney Houston. I, I respect the talent. I respect the voice. I'm just I'm not a huge pop music kind of a person, and uh, by and large, I mean there there are exceptions. There are some things I like from time to time, but that's that's sort of the uh, uh, exception rather than the rule for me. This last one might be the most interesting of all. I'm glad we saved at least a few minutes to get to it. The greatest innovation or progression of technology in the next couple of years. So this one, like the UFC one earlier, is a matter of opinion. I'm just, I was trying to solicit to see what people thought was really going to break big in the next couple of years. Ron Glasnap saying the expansion of free Wi-Fi in major downtown areas, and that's a trend that certainly is very much underway. Uh, I'm going to get to, to Chris's last out of these three just because it's by far the most interesting. Me, I, I went with the cliche of a hovercraft. I'm sure hoping that that's going to come along at some point here. Maybe it's just wishful thinking, but I want me a hovercraft, and I'm not sure it's going to happen in the next four years or not, but I'm just crossing my fingers. Chris Galloway, this this one is amazing. This is This might be the most interesting answer that I got from anybody on any of these ones. 3D printing, which I hadn't really familiarized myself with, until he sent the questionnaire back, and then he sent me some links on it, and I'd watched some things on YouTube. It's basically like replicator technology in, in Star Trek. I watched a video on this. You can scan an item in on a scanner if you have one of these 3D printers and then print it. But what, what you're printing, you basically have a bunch of powder, I guess, that's, that's in a tray. It will print you out something in the exact shape of what was scanned. Uh, the, the example that I saw was a wrench. A guy printed a wrench out on this 3D scanner, an exact replication of uh, the, the wrench that was scanned on there, and just unbelievable to me. And, and there was this was a wrench that had like a moving part or two where you could kind of screw it towards the top to, to move it different ways, uh, to move it in or move it out. Even that was able to be replicated. So you're, you're talking about being able to replicate basic pieces of uh, technology here, maybe even less basic in some instances, and this is something that is headed for everybody's homes, and, and that is an invention that, uh, if it happens, is really going to turn the, the world on, it, on its ear, no question about it. So props to Chris for that one. Uh, Nate, I've made it real difficult for you. Uh, how, how the hell do you follow that one? <laughs> no, and that's an interesting one just to look at for a second. You know, when you say that, my, my first thought is price point. You know, I mean, maybe a decade from now when the price point comes down to where people can afford it, it seems like something that when it comes out, it can't be that inexpensive, that it'll be, you know, priced pretty high. And my second thought was uh, intellectual property and things like that. I mean, you don't, you think the wrench maker is going to let you, you know, there's all these copyrights and trademarks and yada, yada. It, what is it you're producing? Is it in any way a replicate? Can it do any of the things that... The original can do. If that's the case, this will get squashed by major corporations before it even gets off the ground. So, well, but here, here's the thing. Uh, and and uh, from some of the articles I've read on price point, it's dropping dramatically. Right now, you're only finding these in certain labs and universities. Apparently, the price point is coming way down, and Chris is predicting that in the next four years, it's going to continue to plummet. I'll I'll tell you this. You could say the same thing about regular copy machines back in the day. Oh, people are going to copy these books or newspaper articles or magazine articles. You could say the same thing about uh, there, there was an uproar about uh, 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 VCRs when they first came out. Oh, oh, it's going to allow for duplication of uh, things on TV and movies. People will be able to copy movies. and it'll... <laughs> So there, there have been concerns about suppression over time, and, and somehow or another the technology has always overcome that. 
Interesting. Well, this will be uh, – it's, it's something I wasn't even aware of, you know, until you and I mentioned it off air. So it would be interesting to watch. For me, uh, I think it would be more something in the smartphone market, uh, you know, something like – I've seen some prototypes for things like paper-thin smartphones that – you know, can fold into a, a shirt pocket and then you unfold them into like four or eight times the size of the fold. I can see something like that. I think there's a lot of uh, significant investment in that technology right now. Uh, a lot of demand for it in the marketplace for anything that's, you know, new and new and improved smartphone technology. And uh, I know that uh, there are some concerns that the United States is actually approaching its bandwidth capacity. Uh, for smartphones, but that'll probably be alleviated if these uh, companies are intelligent here in the next year. So I, I think we're going to see, you know, I mean, two years ago, the phone I have now, I couldn't even dream that it would exist. You know, I can watch the NBA on my phone. Two years ago, I couldn't have dreamed that I'd be able to watch an NBA. I mean, I could dream about it, but it didn't, it wasn't an option. Now it is an option. Now you can go and get a good smartphone where basically they'll give it to you for a dollar just for the two-year contract. So, you know, I think a lot of uh, additional investment in smartphone technology is, is we'll see a, a generation of smartphones four years from now that we couldn't even dreamed of today. Last question I've got for you, kind of a follow-up. It sounds like in some ways your prediction is dovetailing along with Ron's prediction because I don't know if it will exactly be uh, expansion of Wi-Fi or what the platform will be, but whether it be 3G, 4G, whatever the case is, it sounds like we're moving to more of a universality of people being able to access uh, the World Wide Web on mobile platforms like this. Oh, I agree completely. And look at Japan, where they're at. I mean, we, we trail Japan by half a decade right now. You know, can we catch up? Uh, you know, every this. The, the interesting thing is that the, the thing that's going to take the biggest hit. I know there's some people that'll never get rid of their house phone, but I haven't had a house phone in half a decade. You know, how, how few people are going to have half house phones in another half a decade? Uh, <laughs> the the old Ma Bell AT and T thing is is going to be you know a decade from now completely. I'm guessing 10 to 20 percent of the population will still have a house phone, and 50 years from now, probably nobody will have a house phone. So. That's what's amazing. We're, we're looking at right now with technology and with all these things breaking, uh, old platforms shriveling up, new things coming along to uh, to replace it. And uh, it'll, it'll be very interesting, of course, uh, to crack open the time capsule in four years here and uh, see how all of this manifested itself, but that we put ourselves on the historical record here for our predictions in the different areas between February 29, 2012 and February 29, 2016. Uh, Nate, appreciate it very much. You made my point for me that uh, you were the one guy out of the bunch that I thought could best come in and break this down with me. So uh, I appreciate it, pal, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, doing this again with you sometime soon. Uh, I appreciate it as well, Rick. It's been fun. And uh, the one thing I hope we're totally wrong about is those Miami Heat getting at least – I hope they have zero titles for the next four years, but uh, it's going to be hard to stop that from happening. So, More so than Obama being president, huh? <laughs> we we I sure have well, a lot of priority yes, order about society. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'll trade it. I'll take four more years of Obama. If you guarantee me that he don't win a title, I'll suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the dirty little secret is? If Romney's the Republican nominee, I'm right there with you. <laughs> Beautiful. That's sad. Yeah. That, that is awesome. <laughs> At least we have our priorities in order. All right, Nate, appreciate it. Thanks very much for being on. And everybody, thank you, Rick. Thank you for ver- thank you very much for checking this out. FDH Lounge mini episode number eighty nine, the February 29th time capsule.